going to get tired of listening to me talk. <laughs> um, so I'd like to begin uh, by, it's always interesting to have artists speak on panels without images of their work. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Courtney's art and artistic practice, I'd like to just begin by inviting you, Courtney, to talk a little bit about the work that you do and what, um, you know, kind of what motivates uh, your work and your practice as an artist. Oh, okay, in a very short way. Uh, so, uh, Hakame, hello. I'm Shinnecock from Long Island, New York. And I uh, have been thinking through a question uh, in regards to what it is that I'm doing. Uh, ultimately, that question is, can a culture sustain itself when it no longer has access to the environment that fashions that culture? Uh, many indigenous nations throughout this uh, continent, uh, usually when we say we are who we are, for instance, I'm Shinnecock, uh, the translation in English is the people of, uh, and the people of is in relationship to the territory or cultural landscape um, that we are stewards of. So Shinnecock in our language translates to people of the level land or people of the shore. Uh, in that regards, in dealing with our rising waters, environmental shifting of change, how does one maintain uh, who they are if they no longer have access to uh, the area that somewhat historically uh, defines them. And I've found different ways to navigate through that question, which I think is a great way to delve into uh, your kind of creative call and response as an artist to what you're witnessing, is uh, to have autonomy in developing a question. So if you have a question, you don't necessarily have to have an immediate answer all of the time. You can be on the same journey of development uh, by posing that question. And that, for me, allows me to have my own sovereignty in this uh, space of um, white box work uh, to do whatever I want. Um, <laughs> and I think that that's important uh, because sometimes uh, if you're truly investigating and observing life, you don't have a concrete, consistent way of working through that. So the majority of time I'm working with uh, clay as a material, uh, exploring that relationship to extractive practices. Uh, I'm a materialist. I usually choose materials based on uh, the conversation and, and what's important at the time. So for instance, our relationship over the past few years uh, with the installation, I tend to do installation works because I try to bring people into the environment that I'm witnessing, but leaving it quite open. And uh, doing installation allows you to create environment. And I think creating environment allows people to enter into that environment however they want to. Uh, so there is an installation called Nebulous at the Hood Museum. Uh, I hub all of my work under the word breach because breach in English is an imposition of law. It's a breach of the physical surface. It's also the whale as it rises through the water. I have breach logbook 22, or 20 at uh, the Hood and it's called Nebulous which is this cloud formation and it has a relationship to the Connecticut River and the Wilder Dam flowing down to Long Island Sound and thinking about man-made uh, infrastructure, dam, hydro, electric uh, works through the embodiment of very fragile woven coiled uh, traps per se that are floating on the wall. So I think of clay as a material that is both extractive but can also lend to conversations of environmental fragility in terms of how we care for an object. So if I'm holding this glass, I have to be a little bit more delicate uh, than if I was holding some other material uh, besides glass. Uh, so I think uh, the other thing that I will say is the log books uh, relate to uh, our Shinnecock men were hired onto the Yankee whaling industry uh, at the turn of the century. The imposition of law is also not to take too long with the history here, but uh, we were what was considered state recognized as a nation up until 2010 when federal, um, President Obama's administration, after 50 year fight, uh, gave our community federal recognition. The whale being federally protected was one that when we were state recognized, we did not have access to. So if a whale is part of our cultural patrimony and relationship, how do you continue your cultural sovereignty when there's this nation to nation um, disagreement in terms of imposition of authority? Uh, I also use the whale as a metaphor for indigeneity. People tend to care more about whales than they do indigenous people. Uh, so how do we uh, build relationship and amplification uh, in a greater context of what we're dealing with and what we're going through? Um, so yes, I hope that helped. <laughs> <laughs> 
so um, kind of keeping on this trajectory, David, can you talk a little bit about um, your training and background um, to the you know, biennial, yeah. um, quiet as it's kept, um, that features the work of four indigenous artists um, and kind of how you came into the space of um, thinking more about the incorporation of indigenous arts into the work that you do um, and the work of the Whitney. Yeah, um, so I started the Whitney in 2016 and it was right at the time when the museum was preparing to host an exhibition, a monographic retrospective of Jimmy Dorham. This was a show that started um, at the Hammer Museum. We could have a whole panel about that Jimmy Dorham exhibition. They've done it, we don't need to. <laughs> They've had a few, it's yes. okay. <laughs> so it was a great opportunity for the Whitney to, to really reflect on the work that it had done, and most importantly, had not done with indigenous artists. So this is within the last six years. Um, the thing that was very interesting to come in and begin to work on that, we thought that we needed to have a working group that consisted of curators and educators indigenous and non-indigenous um, Whitney staff to think about that history. But also what we realized is it was as much about the community in which we're working as it was about the art and artists with whom we're working with. How do we create a scenario where um, indigenous peoples would hopefully see a place for themselves there? So um, it was both about having that art on the wall and in the galleries, but also things, and maybe we can talk about this later, like landing knowledge at which is both meaningful and I think symbolic, and the Whitney never had one. It's a kind of a statement of whose one's land is on and the institution kind of holding some responsibility for claiming that it is not our land. Um, my own background, I have to say, when I was studying for my PhD in art history, there were two indigenous artists that were discussed. Um, one of whom was Edgar Heap of Birds, one of whom was Jimmy Dorham. So this has been a profound and really meaningful learning opportunity for for me, and I would say for a lot of my colleagues at the museum. Where there's only one curatorial department at the Whitney, we don't have certain departments or branches that think about you know, specifically uh, indigenous art or African American art. So the great thing has been with this working group, even though we could benefit from having an indigenous curator, don't get me wrong, has been that it became everyone's responsibility to kind of think through what the issues are, what representation looks like when you're planning a show from the collection to think, who's here? Who's not here? What are the questions that these shows needs to ask? Um, for many years I, I ran, I was the director of the collection, and we had a working group to think around um, what shows we could put on from the collection. And I remember that we had just brought in these three incredible uh, baskets by Sean Goshorn. And one of the questions that was raised in this group was, well, we're not a museum of craft. So I think you saw that there are a lot of these structural biases that are both based in racism, based in misogyny, based in kind of uh, a predilection for one kind of work for another. But the question we posed was, well, how do we create a scenario for this work to be the star? And so you kind of, in some ways, if you throw out these old categories of what belonged, what hasn't belonged, but say, what do we want to have a place here, and then how can we create the scenario to make the go shore and basket the thing that everything else circles around? So you look at the show, Sean go shore and basket, and you look at Robert Rauschenberg differently, not Robert Rauschenberg influencing how you look at Sean go shore. So that's some of the work that we've been doing. Um, leading into the biennial, it became an opportunity for Adrian Edwards, who's an incredible curator and co-curator of the show, for us to think about these questions for this exhibition. Two of the four artists that you mentioned, um, Rebecca Belmore and Dwayne Linklater, are based in Canada. So it's an opportunity for an American art museum to stretch what we do, stretch the definition of America. Obviously, that border between the United States and Canada is one imposed on sovereign nations and peoples. So this is an opportunity for the museum to also stretch its definition of itself. And I, I think that leads into a conversation about you know, defining what is American and what, you know, how, what constitutes American art, who gets to be included in the conversation. Um, and you know, as, a, as a curator, a lot of this comes down to what money do I get to use when I buy art for you know, indigenous art and Native American art? Um, and so early on when I started at The Hood, um, I had a conversation about using American acquisitions mm -hmm. funds for purchasing Native American art. And it was a conversation that, well, 
yeah, we haven't done that before. And I was like, but at least since 1924 with the Indian Citizenship Act, we've been Americans. And as I talk with colleagues across the field, this is something that some institutions are hesitant to do. Mm -hmm. Where does the Whitney stand on um, acquisitions mm -hmm. and bringing work by um, you know, Native North American artists into the collection? And how does that help expand what American art can be? Yeah, I think since 2017, it's been a real critical aspect of how we've thought about building the collection. Um, there was this more of an episodic history based on certain curators passions and interests, we were able to develop a great collection of Jean Quittacy Smith because of one curator, for example, or a George Morrison painting that was made in 56 came into the collection in 1957. So there's these episodic histories, but there was no, I would say, signal commitment. That's changed. I think it's changed in that each acquisition committee sees it as their work by acquisition committees, people collecting in painting, sculpture, photography, drawing in prints, video, and, and digital art. So it became everyone's work to do that, but it also became something where we wanted to be able to bring these acquisitions into the museum and put them on the wall. So not just a kind of a typical hoarding of, of work, but also to really say, we're gonna acquire this beautiful K walking stick painting, and then we're gonna put it into an exhibition or frame an exhibition about what it means to paint with color in the 1960s. So that walking stick painting becomes a frame for which to, to see the entire collection. I would say it also became a priority for the museum to present works and really center them. So for example, in the biennial, the first thing you see when you come to the museum is a billboard by Raven Chacon, a photograph taken during the No Access Dakota, No Dakota Access Pipeline protest in 2016 or 2017. That's the experience you have when you will receive the rest of the museum. So how do we create these scenarios within the exhibition, same with the Deani Whitehawk that you see, or Raven's a sound piece when you open and go into one of the floors that create the experience um, for how you experience the rest of the show, but also how we bring those works into the collection because, so they become the generative engine for other thinking around the collection. And you're talking about, you know, kind of space and prioritizing space, but therefore also kind of privileging the epistemologies that underpin the creation of these works and asking people to start there as your opening point before moving into other works. Whereas, you know, I think within spatial organizations, certainly in a lot of encyclopedic museums, um, you have to walk through a lot of rooms or go down into a basement corner. I won't name names. We all know who I'm talking about. Uh, to see work by indigenous artists or artists from you know, um, underrepresented communities. Um, Courtney, I know you think about space a lot in your work and you've already talked about creating space. Um, can we shift this to think about like the creation of space for artists to create work and to bring work into institutions? What would you like to see institutions do um, not only in terms of physical space, but in terms of initiatives and opportunities for indigenous artists to bring works into museums. Oh, goodness. Um, I would like to say I'm just one person from one nation, um, and I don't speak for all, uh, but I, I think I also have to build a bit more patience um, in the lifetime that I have. Uh, one of my favorite artists when I was, uh, about 18 years old was Edgar Hippa Burtz. And it was because of his uh, piece that he did um, today, uh, New York Today, your host is, and he would um, acknowledge the nations from uh, what is now referred to as New York. Uh, one of which is Shinnecock. So New York Today, your host is Shinnecock. Uh, to be from a community, a coastal community that many people may not have heard of and or studied within the context of uh, Native American history, that was important, the notion of visibility. Uh, and, uh, and so there's kind of a built relationship that also happens when our elder artists, and I say the hour in a generalization, because there's over 565 federally recognized nations within this um, country, uh, that doesn't include all of the people uh, here. And I, if I were to take more time, I would ask all of you, how many can you name? And usually when I do that, it's about 20 in the room. Uh, so there's a lack of visibility in that. And 
And to go back to the earlier conversation uh, that happened this morning on repatriation and think about notions of futurity within the NFTs and our future generations, uh, what I'm thinking about with acknowledgement, which is really wonderful, uh, is also the sometimes acknowledgement also adds to um, invisibility. Mm -hmm. In the act of trying to make things visible, we tend to center one autonomous nation and negate the fluid constructs of society that was built on indigenous people. Uh, that shows that sometimes acknowledgement of a territory isn't just one context, it's many who lived throughout that space. Uh, so I appreciate the amplification of indigenous contemporary artists coming into these spaces. <coughs> However, uh, for myself, as someone who works with our water issues, it tends to be uh, Western communities um, Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, Diné Uranium uh, issues uh, being more prevalently seen within uh, major Eastern museums and contemporary art spaces. Uh, so what happens to the people that are actually from that territory and the impact that's happening there? And so I appreciate it, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done uh, in, in that regard. Uh, so I think I'll just wait a bit in terms of what can we do. I think it is happening, uh, but I think people need to stretch and broaden their horizons in terms of indigenous relationships. Uh, I, is that helpful? <laughs> okay. Um, so in thinking about, you know, kind of your work in coastal indigenous communities, um, and your work between um, kind of thinking about our relationship to place in the environment. Um, how have you, how have people responded to that and the call of you asking people to think more deeply about their connections to place? Is there a story that comes to mind or an interaction you've had where someone either really gets it or really doesn't get it? Mm -hmm. uh, I've had to figure out ways to maneuver within this space in order to survive. And I think one of the examples I remember was I had a piece uh, in an exhibition at the Museum of Art and Design. And I went to check my coat and pick it up. And when I was there, they had asked someone who was picking up their coat uh, if they had been to the exhibition on the third floor. And they said, oh, that native show, no. And, uh, and in that regard, I realized that there are certain people that uh, find certain exhibitions relative to their life and other exhibitions not. Uh, for instance, uh, being you know, the native show is something that I struggle with in terms of who's gonna stay a while. And if we're gonna have conversations about our global impact and relationship to environment, that's all of our responsibility. That's not amongst indigenous people to fix. Uh, so I have navigated those spaces to be mindful of what I participate in um, and who I work with. And I'm very much interested in collaboration and indigenous knowledge and science. Um, my brother is a deep sea diver and marine biologist. My sister works in indigenous law and water policy. So uh, together we found ways to exist as who we are, Shinnecock people, without having to navigate the systems and the rules and the dynamics that sometimes infringe upon uh, who listens. Uh, so I think that I, I've, I didn't come to that without being harmed. So through the harm of working in this space, I've had to figure out maneuvers to survive. Uh, I think relationships of collaboration between science and art and ecology and environmental and political spaces are a way to bridge uh, humanity and, and conversations. Uh, I think it's interesting to be here today for this word culture fix. Um, I don't know the fix part, and then you can also be like fixed in a position of time. And I think we should just be fluid in our relationships and our conversations. And that usually lends to the best uh, situations for what I've experienced. David, what about um, maybe an interaction that you've had of someone's response to seeing works in the Whitney or something that you've learned um, through your interaction with these works? Yeah, I think. One that stands out is when Alan Michelson did uh, a project at the Whitney. Alan Michelson, who's a, a, a Mohawk artist, who did this beautiful video that was called Wolf Nation that is uh, filmed with night vision that showed kind of the, the wolf at the work when no one can see. And I think it was also this kind of beautiful metaphor for the work of indigenous artists and, and indigenous peoples 
who have been made invisible. So this kind of question of visibility and who, who has presence and who does not. But Alan also made this incredible augmented reality piece, which was to transform the lobby of the Whitney back into a tobacco field. So when you would look at your phone, you would see what is the lobby overlaid with the tobacco field, which was what it was before colonization. So this really, I think, beautiful talk about our conversation about technology earlier on, this beautiful kind of layering of place, the centrality and importance of place, and how technology can help as a form of augmented memory. It can't change what happened to that land or what is on it now, but it can give this great sensibility of what the past has been. And I think that the, the interactions that I had about that was just kind of a, and this, for someone who is kind of new to working on these issues, but it's not new to thinking about kind of American history, the level of kind of deep surprise by people to think that this was something other than on the west side of Manhattan, what it was. Kind of the, the sense that history is very thin when we kind of peel back and look at, as it's taught. So the possibility of art museums, even if they're ones like the Whitney being those for modern contemporary art, to engage in deeper histories, to be able to kind of put the record at least on the line about what these places were, who they belong to, and, this, and that it, not, it hasn't always been this way, nor does it have to be this way. So I think that was one great, kind of one that sticks out. And another is with the Diani Whitehawk uh, painting that's part of the Biennial right now. That's this beautiful large painting made out of tens of thousands of glass beads. And the fact that so many people come up and look at that and say, it looks like a Barnett Newman. I think the conditioning of people to look, particularly when you go into a museum of American art, with one set of criteria about who images have belonged to, what a certain kind of painting is. And I think that's so much of Diani's practice too, is to recenter kind of this way of looking, to say that ideas of conceptual art and abstraction have been part of indigenous thinking for millennia. So I think if the museum can play a role in this reimagining, recentering, and also not making an opposition, but creating a bridge so that one looks at a Barnett Newman painting differently after seeing a Diani Whitehawk painting, I think that's an important thing that, that we can do as well. Yeah. Um, so Courtney, I know that you have, um, you have work uh, in the US Department of State's Art and Embassies program. Um, what has that experience, um, or what was that experience like? Um, and how, do you, um, how would you like to see US-based indigenous artists kind of begin to work more internationally and build um, coalition with indigenous artists throughout the globe? Well, I think we already have been. Um, we're probably one of the best examples of indigenous relations and global relations as um, our own communities. Like, uh, I mean, Shinnecock, if you were to look in any um, beginning of New York Times, we've been very politically active throughout our history uh, with this country. Uh, and globally and internationally, um, uh, we're at the forefront and I think that a lot of times uh, with social media in terms of its amplification, it also lends to a bit of um, that component of, of uh, visibility and visibility because sometimes there's a lot of work that's being done, but people aren't selfieing it. Uh, it's not something that they're sharing a lot. Um, I've worked with uh, refugees in different parts of the world and I don't share that because uh, certain communities need to be protected. Uh, so just because you don't see uh, the work doesn't mean that it's not necessarily existing. And I think that that's something that, uh, I, well, I was thinking and I appreciate that you were sharing about Diani's work because I also find that sometimes women, um, and I, I'm, I'm not gonna just stick to one gender, but there are certain communities that are not still heard in the arts and in the sectors uh, and need further amplification because uh, sometimes I wonder if I'm gonna be 80 and then that's when an article will be written about the work and because that tends to what 
ha uh, happens to women. Uh, but Diani's piece also included the hands of many makers, um, uh, and I can't speak to it, but it was something that I thought was really beautiful. It, it included community in the practice of making, uh, and, uh, and they all stood there um, together because there were thousands of beads, and that also was an extension of community in terms of trade and international relationship, um, how we source our materials um, is an international practice of responsibility. Uh, I also, with, with Breach, I, I do that, but I guess I don't talk about it too much. I, I travel the world uh, pre-COVID to meet with other coastal <coughs> communities that are not being heard. So if Shinnecock people aren't being heard in our water issues and our greater context of global impact, uh, there have to be other coastal communities who are not also heard. So fortunately, I found that by traveling um, the tall ship route that my ancestors were on, I have um, traveled up to Mi'kmaq territory, to Nova Scotia. I've worked with Alan Silliboy, uh, Franny Francis, Charles Doucette. I've um, been fortunate enough to, uh, through the Art and Embassies program, I traveled to uh, Geneva and uh, studied a bit of Lake Limon, which I didn't understand, is very much like an ocean in that territory, and that was beautiful. I have also traveled to uh, Utkiagvik in the North Slope region uh, during the bowhead whale harvest, and Aotearoa uh, multiple times for an indigenous artist exchange uh, through Manos Nathan, who has since passed away. Uh, but it's about relationship, and I think indigenous people know that. Uh, so we're just, we're doing it, we're just, maybe not um, getting the amplification, but that's not why we do it. I think that's the thing about art. I find art to be a space that can help, but also hinder. And whether it's gonna acknowledge you or not, you still have to get the work done. Um, so I think we're doing a really, have been lots of us doing amazing work. <laughs> um, and any kind of support I think is helpful to be able to do that amazing work. I, I, uh, I was often community crowdfunding that got me plane tickets to do the work that I've done. Um, and, and I think that I owe a lot to my community. And I mean community in like a broad sense mm -hmm. of global community. Yeah. Well, I think we're at time for questions from the audience. Jamie, can I ask a question of you? Because, sure. because I think I've followed your work for many years, and I think that all of us have seen that there has been more reception. Um, Aperture Magazine, other journals really looking at indigenous art and art issues. So there's been a change, but what has it been like for you as been a, a specialist in this field to witness this change? What good has it brought? What qualms might you have with it? I'm just interested in your take as such an expert. Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, for me, I really kind of transitioned. A lot of my work and training was focused on decolonizing and decolonization. Um, but I became really frustrated with that because as useful as it is, um, it's always still centering the colonial. And I felt like I was like constantly pushing against something and it felt, um, I felt frustrated by the fact that I'm always trying to deconstruct something and not thinking about what to build. Mm -hmm. And so I've had this shift where I started thinking along with um, you know, other indigenous curators like Heather Otto and Heather Igloliorte, um, Wanda Nana Bush, who wasn't able to join us today, about indigenizing. Um, and for me, you know, as, as an Osage person, an Osage curator, um, centering Osage ways of knowing and relationality and how, it, how I was taught to act and relate um, and the ethics embedded within that as being my starting point. Mm -hmm. And it's not that that, and that's inherently accessible to other communities. Um, but that is the starting point rather than, okay, what do I need to not do? Um, and so I think that's been a really exciting kind of shift in the field of thinking about. Um, and it's the same thing that, we, that you were talking about with, um, you know, not starting with conversations about American modernists who are recognized but let's start with you know, indigenous communities whose um, you know, abstraction and use of materials actually pre-existed um, and informed the work that American modernists were doing. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, a question? 
You were t talking about, obviously, how the Whitney has done, has moved forward on this, but what are you hearing about in the general uh, museum community across the United States? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's interesting. We were talking about this a little bit beforehand, where you see some great work being done. A Kent Monkman, very public, very visible, very kind of reorienting projects, like at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I think what you realize very quickly from the three experiences that we talk about here is that the, each museum is so different. The history that it's embedded within, the site where it's based, the collection that it has, the people that are working in it. I think there is, though, I think maybe not too much of a blanket statement to say, there is a growing recognition about the importance of, within the United States context, um, that this is, at, working with indigenous artists has, is something that I would say most museums have not done a great job of doing. So I do think that it, and I'm not gonna say that a blanket statement overall because a lot of great people have been doing great work. Um, I will say that there also has been, there have been great galleries that have supported this work. I'm thinking about Boakley Gallery in Minneapolis. I'm thinking about the Garth Greening Gallery in New York. So I think the different levels of visibility, the different ways of bringing work to attention from museums to galleries to public art projects to community-based work to online forums. I think that that visibility is a, a big part of what I think you see happening um, across the field. I would just add to that that um, uh, it is, it's still an interesting space to observe in terms of uh, you can't decolonize an institution. It's, it, um, it is what it is. Uh, and, and then the other thing is that um, money. Um, it's about, as, as much as I'd like to say it is, and it also is, money determines what's seen and what isn't seen, what's invested in and what isn't invested in. Uh, and, and so a lot of museums, especially after COVID, are dependent on who's buying and placing the work. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that leaves a lot of people out of that conversation uh, in terms of who determines that value and who doesn't. Uh, so you're either relative or not relative. Um, and, uh, and that is something that I'll just be honest about, that it is still the, hist the history of this world in terms of art uh, and authority. Um, and, and, and so it's appreciative, but it's also just something to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Hi, um, this question's for Courtney. <clears throat> you had mentioned some of your travels in, in working with other uh, areas of the world. Uh, I wonder if you could speak to the, uh, the collaborative process behind that. I mean, obviously you're coming from a different background, you're meeting people from different cultures and different backgrounds. Um, what does that look like? I mean, do you guys come together, create art together? Do you talk about your challenges together and try to create solutions? If you could talk through that a bit, that'd be interesting to hear. Uh, yes, art is also therapy. Um, <laughs> and being with community is very therapeutic. Uh, and it is something that we definitely need to be resilient as uh, people. Um, and also to protect our joy. Uh, that's something I do want to acknowledge in terms of my history of knowing uh, Jamie, Dr. Jamie Powell, uh, is that you know we've our kids have played together. There's there's just something that is unique to being a human being, and um, and that's one space that I have appreciated in terms of my relationships with people. Uh, but um, Alan Silliboy, uh brought us together for the path we share up in. Um, uh, Nova Scotia, we went to a place called the Deanery Project and spent about two days there uh, developing work together and, and talking and listening through our ideas. Uh, and that came from the path we share is the path of the whale as it comes up from Florida to Bay of Fundy to feed and how it passes by Long Island. And so what is our built responsibility in relationship to this, this navigational path of reciprocity to uh, a species that is imperative to who we are as a people, and also um, one which we are responsible for. Uh, I've, I learn a lot, and I think that's important. I think sometimes, dependent on the human being, sometimes people feel like they know everything. I don't know anything, really. I'm learning, uh, and I think that's an important part about life. Uh, I've also, um, with Manos, when he, 
when I, Monos was somebody I admired when I was younger, like Edgar Heap of Birds, uh, but I didn't know I was ever gonna meet him. And I actually met him through knowing Magdalena Adundo, who came to visit when I was a graduate student at RISD. I could go on and on about relationships in terms of how one person lends um, a, a moment in life to lead you to others. And I think that that's not something that, I mean, it commonly happens in the art world, but in a different way of trajectory. And like, I wanna meet you so I can get here. Uh, but sometimes you just meet people as, as who they are and, and what they can just be who they are. Uh, so Manos wanted us as a younger generation of people working with clay, with uku, uh, to be supportive of one another. Uh, and di the digital realm, although it takes a lot of um, the environment, uh, was one where we can stay in touch. So if we're having a bad day, if we need to uplift one another, we reach out, um, we uh, protect our joy, and, uh, and we say, you know, uh, remember this or remember that. And I think that that was what um, Manos and Colleen and we type, uh, uh, the Jubilee just happened. So if you're wanting to know who's been honored that are really magnificent uh, people, uh, they were honored um, as artists within um, Aotearoa most recently this past week. Uh, and those people I'm honored to know. Uh, so I think uh, one thing I learned when I went to Geneva was thinking about diplomacy. And one of the most diplomatic, two diplomatic spaces that I've found to be of um, interest, one is being on a ship. Being on a ship, uh, if you have a mutiny, it's because you didn't realize who you need. Um, you need to work together in order to survive on a ship. Uh, and in a kitchen, that was the other place that I found diplomacy, was when I was up in Ukyagvik with Anupiak people who were feeding generationally their community. And when people tend to go there and attack people for their subsistence harvesting rights in relationship to whales, uh, they just fly in, they take the videos that they need, and they leave. But they don't stay with the community and understand their responsibility in caring for the whale and their reciprocity to their environmental ecology and their knowledge of marine biology in relationship to that. So I was there for about a week and gifted the opportunity to be in a kitchen. And when you have um, one thing you should know, always listen to the eldest woman in the kitchen. Um, and in terms of boiling uh, the meat, uh, it was a conversation of what, how much salt to add. A little bit of salt, not a lot of bit of salt. And everybody would come in, the aunties and things like that. Uh, I made sure to listen to the eldest. And so when a younger auntie came in and said, who told you to do that? I just pointed to the elder. <laughs> and that was the space of diplomacy that I understood. Uh, so I could share a lot of stories, which I think might, I just appreciate the opportunities that I've had, um, but it is definitely not something that I knew uh, would have happened a long time ago. Um, so thank you for, for having me today. Well, and I think that reminder of our relationships being one of the most important things that we have um, and you know the the ability for arts to help us recognize our shared humanity is a great note to end on. So thank you both for your time and sharing your knowledge with us. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you.